Their neighborhood was alerted to the Marshall Fire more than an hour after others nearby. If not for a police officer with a megaphone, they might not have made it out. They thought she was lost in the fire. Turns out, she's just lost. If we could find her, it would be a game changer for the family. The state's bungling of a free mask rollout this week is causing unnecessary confusion. Denver voters chose open space over development for the Park Hill Golf Course. Now the city has thrown the open space group off the committee deciding what to do with the land. And it's a word of thanks second chance. The Marshall Fire paused our effort to help Afghan refugees get settled in our community. They patiently waited while we helped neighbors in Boulder County. Now let's finish the work of helping them put down roots in Colorado, because this is next. If the emergency notification to save your life came 90 minutes after your neighbors got theirs, you would want an explanation. And you'd want Marshall Zellinger to keep asking, even when he's getting the runaround. Almost three weeks after the Marshall fire, our Marshall Zellinger wants to know why one neighborhood was the last to know that their lives were in danger. There is no emergency notification that would have saved Jody Ringel's home. It, it's just very sad. It's, it's like someone just bombed it. Jody and her husband live just south of Harper Lake in Louisville. That's to the right of the road. The neighborhood on the left got an evacuation order at 1.15 p.m. Jody's neighborhood on the right, 2.51 p.m. That is, if you had a landline or signed up to receive the opt-in notifications. I mean, we haven't had a landline in, I don't know, 15, 18 years. I mean, it's been a long time. I don't know any, I don't know anyone that has a landline. This is the home Jody had just returned to at 1.20 p.m. after a workout. She said it was a short time later that she heard what sounded like a megaphone out front. It could have been a whole different outcome had I been in the shower or the restroom or down basement and never heard something that made me run to the front window. Outside, she saw an officer about to leave after talking to one of her neighbors. And I said, what's going on? And he goes, you need to evacuate. And I said, now? He goes, now. Okay. And so if you want to say that's how I got notified. So my niece says, are you okay? Let me know if you need anything or if you need to come here. That was at 1.30. I thought, well, that's really weird. What's going on? Beth Malone lives farther east in the same area that received the 2.51 p.m. evacuation order. I was already on the road when I got the notification. Her home was not harmed by the Marshall Fire, but she got a head start on packing and evacuating because of texts from friends and family. No, that's not how I'd like to find out about these things. We have no wedding pictures. I would have grabbed wedding pictures. I, we have no family portraits. My mom's wedding ring that I cherish, I, I would love it if they found that even more than my own. Why didn't we get an alert, you know, in plenty of time? Why did this particular area get notified so much later than the areas surrounding me. Why did an area of Louisville that saw homes destroyed get notified 90 minutes after neighborhoods on all sides of it? Boulder County told me to ask Louisville. Louisville told me we're still looking into it. I would like to know that they were going to fix it before the next crisis arrives. There is a difference between we're still looking into it and we're still trying to figure out how to explain what happened. Thankfully, no one died in that area that was alerted at 251. It's just a matter of could more notice have been given. Jody Ringel wishes she had more notice so that she could have thought about what to leave with mm -hmm. versus being kind of like scatterbrained at that moment. Um, she left with passports and laptops. Meanwhile, Beth had time to an hour, I think she mm -hmm. said, to uh, evacuate because of the text from friends and family. Between the speed and the power and the botched alerts with this fire, it's amazing that there was not a huge loss of life. And everyone's saying, what if this had happened at night? And that's what we want to know the answer to, because the next time it could happen at night. Marshall, thank you. Instead of focusing on being ready to fight fires and keep the public safe, some fire departments spent their day today fielding phone calls from Coloradans looking for free masks that they didn't have. Democratic Governor Jared Polis announced yesterday the state would make KN95 and surgical grade masks available at no cost to the public. State said they could be picked up this week at fire stations, public libraries, rec centers, VFWs, YMCAs, community centers. The state even put a list of distribution sites on its website. Only problem is, a good number of those locations had no idea this was happening. Firefighters in Brighton were confused when the call started coming in. We were surprised when we got our first few calls this morning. We didn't really understand where this information was coming from, so we quickly went online and looked at and realized that it was coming from the 
local news sources. We didn't know anything at that point. We haven't been told anything from the state level or local level that we would be receiving any masks for the community. For a list of the places that actually do have masks right now, we have that in the story on 9news.com. There are no real options in Denver at the moment. The state website says the city of Denver is working to identify rec centers that will eventually have masks for public distribution. The Polish administration's botched rollout of the statewide mask giveaway added unnecessary confusion and created work for Coloradans at firehouses, libraries and such. Places that had to explain that they did not have the free masks that the governor had promised the public. This mistake, this apparent rush to claim credit for a program before it was functional, erodes public trust. It should not, however, be confused with the damage that's done by elected leaders who ignore and mock public health recommendations. But we can't lower the bar for evaluating the Polis administration just because some of its critics have abandoned adult behavior altogether. Coloradans should expect competent handling of the pandemic's shifting challenges. And the rollout of the statewide mask program did not meet that standard. Our positivity rate's been dropping a bit from a pandemic high. 26.7% of the COVID-19 tests done in the state over the last seven days came back hot. A week ago, we were at nearly 30%. Colorado's Democratic Senator Michael Bennett is often so visibly frustrated at how the U.S. Senate works, we have even asked him if he's still interested in working there. Today, Bennett rose to urge his colleagues to pass voting rights legislation to make all of America's voting more like the easy, safe process we know in Colorado. Now, Senator Bennett knows this is not going to happen. Every Republican in the Senate is opposed, and two Democrats won't override the filibuster to do this. In contrast to Houston, where there's one drop box, in my hometown of, Col of Denver, where there are 500,000 registered voters, we have 40 drop boxes in Denver. We're a lot smaller, but we got 40 times the number of drop boxes that they have in Houston. Every American should be able to vote like we do in Colorado, thanks to my colleague from Colorado, Senator Hickenlooper, and what he did when, when, when he was governor. Democratic leaders in the Senate appear intent on forcing a vote on this, even knowing that it won't succeed. Bennett pointed to the filibuster today as the roadblock to all types of legislation he says is supported by a majority of Americans. Things like gun background checks and letting Medicare negotiate drug prices. Now, we should note that Bennett himself has supported preserving the filibuster, the 60-vote threshold in the past. In 2017, he was among 61 senators who wrote to Senate leadership urging them to keep it. Republicans in the Senate are opposed to a person to the voting rights reforms, and Democratic Senators Kirsten Sinema of Arizona and Joe Manchin of Virginia have said that they are not going to change the filibuster to get it done. We paused your final Word of Thanks microgiving campaign of 2021 because the Marshall Fire broke out. It was clear there was an immense need, and you have raised almost $2.5 million for fire-related campaigns since then. Tonight, we're restarting the campaign that we interrupted, hoping that you are still open to helping that nonprofit complete its mission for our community. Your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week returns to support Hope Communities, as that nonprofit helps Afghan newcomers navigate life in Colorado. Lainey Hashem is Hope Communities Navigator. She works with resettled Afghan families and provides them with one-to-one -one service in the way that only somebody who speaks their language and knows their culture can. She helps them find the resources, the training, the services they need to be connected with life in Colorado to become self-sufficient, successful, and happy here. With all the Afghan families brought to Colorado, there is more demand for Laney's navigation services than Hope Communities can currently meet. So that nonprofit is raising money to bring on additional staff who also have the language and cultural skills to help our new neighbors thrive here. There was a time last year when the airlift out of Afghanistan really had our attention. It had our resources for a moment. Well, now those families are our neighbors, and we have the opportunity to help them start the new year in their new country with the continued support that they'll need to thrive. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. I'll send you the link to donate. Colorado's got a reputation that goes back decades as a place where refugees are welcomed and thrive as part of the community. So let's help our newest neighbors from Afghanistan succeed here, even after attention is turned elsewhere and even after our attention was briefly diverted by the Marshall Fire. Thank you so much. Sadness turns to hope for a family in Louisville. We thought there was no way she made it out. And our 
kind of like already coping with the fact that she was gone. They were ready to mourn their dog. Now they're on a mission to find her. A group won the battle to preserve the Park Hill Golf Course's open space. Now they got booted off the city committee planning its future after they picked the mayor's former opponent for their seat. The story of open space and retaliation, next. What a cold day. Freezing fog, freezing drizzle, light snow, but the sun returns tomorrow ahead of a Friday storm and chance for more snow. Our high today couldn't even get above freezing 26 degrees at DIA. Cold air is headed all the way to central Texas. Skies will clear out tonight, but we're still under a winter weather advisory until 8. Advisories for dangerous wind chills to the north and east of us and a little bit of light snow to the north and east out on the plains over the next two to three hours. Winter weather advisory cancels out at 8, but it's slick out there. Windshields, sidewalks, roadways, tough going. We get you some sunshine tomorrow, a nice dry day, and then things change again on Friday. Our low tonight, a cold 13 under cloudy skies. Tomorrow's high at 43. Friday, increasing clouds and a chance for snow. And then we get you a dry weekend ahead of a third storm system and chance for snow. And that's Monday night into Tuesday. There's still hope of finding pets that went missing in the Marshall Fire. The not knowing, though, is complicated for those families looking for pets they love. Our Katie Eastman went to the Cole Creek Ranch neighborhood in Louisville. Acceptance and hope are emotions Jason Harrington has become familiar with. Really was a beautiful neighborhood. He came to terms with all of his belongings burning. It's hard to look at. He accepted his dog Violet was gone too. You wish he had five more minutes or had known, you know, earlier so you could get make sure you had your pets, you know. The 12 pound Chihuahua Boston Terrier mix was scared of everything. And Jason's family couldn't find her when they evacuated. Some of her nicknames were cow dog, muffin top, snickerdoodle, pudge muffin. Those were Jupy, her nicknames. Violet Gupta, Vinny, Kanger deer dog. But they deer still dog. might be. The dog bloodhound, when they came back like this way, he was like going crazy right around this little thing. So. A bloodhound trained to sniff out human and animal remains tracked Violet scent off the property and back. And I figured the closure would be he would bark and, you know, say that the remains are in the house. And when he came back saying they got out, I mean, I was I was shocked. The big fear now is that she made it out and that scent was from a couple weeks ago and it's been sub-zero temperatures. And Jason went from grieving a loss to hoping his lost dog is found. So now this is like, hey, there's hope, but you know, it's going to be extra tough to get our hopes up and then, you know, just realize, hey, nothing happens and we don't find her. Accepting hope is hard too, but Jason would rather have that than nothing at all. If your hopes aren't up, then they're down and that's no good, you know? <laughs> Jason and his family were renting a home in the Coal Creek Ranch neighborhood. They've decided to move back to Texas to be with relatives. But Jason, he moved his flight back to keep looking for Violet. When he got the news, she still might be out there. Couldn't imagine leaving without her. And they've done all the stuff that you might think of to try and get her to come back if she's in the area. Yeah, so many families have left out food and water, left out a shelter. Uh, Jason even put out his clothing so mm. that it has his scent on it. Oh, that's just heartbreaking. All right. Thank you, Kitty. They convinced voters to protect the Park Hill Golf Course open space. Now they've been kicked off the city committee planning its future. Busting a move all day long to get drivers attention and protect road crews. That is dedication. That is something that's not horrible. So that is next. Advocates for keeping the Park Hill Golf Course open space in Denver won on Election Day. But the city just threw them off the committee that will guide how that land will be used. The group Save Our Open Space tried to nominate Mayor Hancock's former opponent, Lisa Calderon, to their seat on the committee. That did not go over well. Save Open Space convinced voters back in November to approve the ballot measure making development of the land harder while defeating a ballot measure that was backed by developers. The city is supposed to be neutral on all of this, though open space advocates have long said the Hancock administration just wants the land developed. 
Park Hill Golf Course Area Plan Steering Committee is the group that will decide what to do with the land based off community feedback. Community has called for a new park and community gathering space, more trees, youth and rec sports, affordable housing, and a space for a grocery store. When Save, our, when Save Open Space nominated the mayor's former opponent for the seat, Dr. Lisa Calderon, the city sent them a letter saying, quote, We believe that further participation by Save Open Space as part of the committee would only result in further discord within the community. So off they go. If you've ever wanted to own a slice of the Old West, it can now be yours for the low, low price of $4.7 million. The old Cowtown Resort south of Sawatch is up for sale, all of it, all together. 320-acre ranch has a saloon and a restaurant, general store, and a chapel. The Zillow listing says there are 22 bedrooms and 24 bathrooms in town. $4.7 million is the ask. It's been on the market for more than a few months now, so you could probably get them down to uh, four even. And this reminds me of that HBO show whose name I can't recall. By the way, this is not the Old West Town formerly owned by one of the Koch brothers. We checked on that. Dancing in the middle of the street to keep other people safe? Ah, that's something that's not horrible. Richard in Boulder looked out the kitchen window Monday morning, saw this guy shaking his moneymaker in the middle of the street, was thinking, well, that's an interesting way to go through life. Uh, Richard did some investigating. It turns out he's actually a flagger for a construction crew down the street. He dances like this all day long trying to get driver's attention so that people will be safe. Maybe a vest next time as well. It's a good way to burn some calories. Send us things that aren't horrible. Anything that isn't horrible doesn't matter what it is. Email photos or video to next at 9 or tag us on Twitter using the hashtag HeyNext. A few weeks ago, we started working together to give resettled Afghan refugees a long-term boost in our community to really put down roots, and then the fire interrupted our efforts. The need's still there, so let's give it another go. Next. Colorado stepped up big time to provide the immediate needs of Afghan families resettled here, things like clothing and meals, places to stay. Now those families have been here for a few months and they could use additional help getting established and connected long term so they can succeed and thrive. And that's where Hope Communities comes in. They have a navigator, a woman named Lainey Hashem, who has more families needing her specialized help than she can handle alone. So that nonprofit is fundraising to add another navigator who also speaks the language, knows the culture, can help people really put down roots for the long term in a community. Scan the QR code on your screen or text thanks to 303-871-1491 to join Join me in giving so that Hope Communities can do that great work in our community. Holly writes in tonight to say Marshall Zellinger is just the best and keeps getting better. Holly writes, I trust him to dig into local issues like no one else I have ever seen. I happen to agree with you, Holly, and I'll give you my personal opinion of what makes Marshall Zellinger so good. He doesn't do this work so that powerful people will like him and invite them to their holiday parties. Marshall does this work for you, people he may never meet, who deserve better answers than what they're getting from people in power. Marshall and I will see you next time.